to you by dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK, Alzheimer's Society, Race Against Dementia and the Alzheimer's Association, bringing you research, news, career tips and support. Hello and thank you for tuning into the Dementia Researcher podcast. I'm Dr. Anna Malach, and I'm a research fellow at the UK Dementia Research Institute at UCL. And I use spatial transcriptomics to study cellular changes around plaques and Alzheimer's disease. It's my pleasure to be hosting this very special podcast recorded on location from the ADPD conference in Gothenburg. This is the second show in a two-part special, bringing you all the news and highlights from this leading international conference, sharing some of the latest development in neurodegeneration research. Today, we're going to reflect on the scientific program and the talks that have taken place over the last three days of the event. That could be from Thursday afternoon to Saturday, but who knows, I'm sort of losing track of my days. <laughs> Joining me to share their highlights are the amazing Dr. Chi Yude Momo, the fabulous Dr. Melissa Schofield, and the incredible Emily McCann. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Let's go around the table and do some proper introduction. Tell us about yourself and what you do. I'm Emily McCann. I'm a final year PhD student at University of Queensland. Um, my project is about developing a cognitive tests to pick up dementia a bit earlier and hopefully trying to relate that to the functional changes that are happening in their brain. So I'm Dr. Chi Ude Mama and I'm a senior researcher based primarily at Imperial College in London, um, Karolinska Institute, Aga Khan University in Kenya, and also I'm currently doing a fellowship on equity and brain health at the University of San Francisco in California, part of the Global Brain Health Institute. So my research work program, I suppose, uses a, um, translational approaches towards demand and prediction and prevention of dementia with a focus on diverse populations. And Melissa. <laughs> so I'm Dr. Melissa Schofield, based at the University of Manchester. I'm a postdoctoral research associate. And uh, we're performing multionic analyses across multiple dementias. So we've already looked at Alzheimer's and Huntington's, but we're extending that to Parkinson's disease, dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, and also Parkinson's without dementia, with the aim of seeing what similarities and differences there are between diseases and how we can explain why they have different clinical progressions and symptoms. And we're focusing on metabolomics, metalomics, and also proteomics as part of the multiomics network. Very nice. Thank you, everyone. Before we get to your highlights, I should ask if any of you are presenting this week. Tell us about that. So, Emily, you mentioned you gave an online presentation. A lot of my project was having a look at um, positronomous and tomography imaging um, to have a look at sort of metabolic changes in the back of the brain, um, particularly for typical Alzheimer's disease, uh, posterior cortical atrophy, which is a visual variant of Alzheimer's disease, uh, Parkinson's with and without dementia, and dementia with all your bodies. So all of those diseases tend to have um, metabolic changes in the back of the brain, sort of reflecting the degeneration. So um, my project was about developing perception tests to target those regions specifically for these kinds of dementias. Um, so yeah, it's going pretty well so far. We've been able to pick up some really early subtle changes in people's cognition prior to them being picked up on sort of traditional clinical pen and paper tests. Um, so it's been interesting to see that and also work with our patients and their clinicians in order to better manage their diseases as well. Very nice. So the PhD is slowly wrapping up. It's <laughs> trying to, yeah. Um, hopefully try and collect as much data as possible um, over the next few months and um, yeah, go from there. Do you, if you gave a, gave a talk, I had a poster. Uh, I gave an online talk, so I think it was released on the very first day, on the Tuesday actually, yeah. so when everyone came for sort of the pre-conference day. Um, but it was just explaining some of the metabolomics work we've done. So. Uh, based on previous metabolomics we've done in Alzheimer's and Huntington's, we've been quite surprised at the number of similarities that we saw between what are generally two very different diseases. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to see if we looked at the Parkinson's disease dementia brain, how similar it would look if it would look more like Huntington's or Alzheimer's. So we work with postmortem brain tissues using multiple regions, about nine of them. So we want to see if changes are localized or if they're even in regions with low levels of neurodegeneration. Um, we're quite surprised to see that, for example, changes in glucose metabolism pathways, really high levels of fructose, which we didn't really 
necessarily expect to see in almost every single region that we're looking at, which mm -hmm. suggests that glucose is sort of moving away from glycolysis towards other metabolism pathways. So like polyol pathway, pentose phosphate pathway, also extremely high levels of urea, which Wow. You, yeah, which you don't expect to see in the brain. We're kind of scratching our heads trying to figure out where exactly it's coming from because as far as we know, there isn't a complete urea cycle in the brain. Um, I think there's um, been some studies to suggest that exposure of, cel of cells to amyloid beta could actually produce a complete urea cycle, which would explain, at least in Alzheimer's, where it's coming from. But I'm quite interested in seeing if other proteins would do the same thing. Can I just ask a quick question around that? Mm -hmm. like, maybe they shouldn't have made it on demand now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm just quite intrigued. But how do you um, look into just en ensure like the viability of the samples? Could it be because it's post mortem tissue? And I'm just wondering about so, um, contaminants. We're very careful about the post mortem delay. So we've gone to extremely long lengths to make sure that it's at least under 24 hours. So we actually okay. did a study in the rat brain to look yeah. at the effect of post mortem delay on mm -hmm. different metabolites. Mm -hmm. So the urea, things like the urea and the fructose actually aren't too bad. Like uh, up to 24 hours, they're fine. I see. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, some metabolites, if you go past 24 hours, or even some of them, by you get by the time you're at the 24 hour point, they're already changing. So you have mm -hmm. to be careful depending on what you're looking at. But we used our previous study to make sure that the things we were looking at were more stable. And just obviously the question on my mind now is, Parkinson's more like Huntington's or Alzheimer's disease? More like Alzheimer's. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we also looked at metals and we found decreased copper levels in almost every single region that we looked at in the Alzheimer's and the Parkinson's, but we didn't find that in the Huntington's. We found altered selenium in the Huntington's. Mm -hmm. So it seems like they're, those two are closer together. And I'm interested in seeing if the dementia with Lewy bodies mm -hmm. is yeah. in the middle or if it just looks like the Parkinson's disease dementia. We're just getting the tissues for those now, but quite interesting. So. Are you getting them from the UK brain bank? Or? From the NIH brain bank in the US. Okay. Yeah, so we've actually had to get them from two of the brain banks that are part of that network. So the Harvard brain bank and the Sepulveda brain bank. So we've got quite a big sample size. Now. So it's 15 versus 15, which isn't huge. But when you're working with brain tissues, it's difficult. And we're looking at 10 brain regions. So it's 300 samples. So We've been spending it's over scales. a year getting, getting these samples, oh so quite excited to finally have them. Good. Um, and I, I actually gave a talk as well on the big scary stage downstairs um, at an industry symposium on Thursday, because um, we've been looking at spatial transcriptomics, which is kind of this new and moving field where a lot of companies are now bringing out um, new new tools such as the Nanostring Cosmics machine and the Xenium from 10x and all of these things and uh, as part of my research i had the chance to trial the nanostring cosmics machine ahead of schedule in september so we got the data uh, from from our mouse sample and we've been since then desperately trying to analyze it which turns out was a bigger job than anticipated i don't know as a wet lab biologist i thought maybe we'll just do some analysis and we start in september and we're slowly finishing up uh, but because we're now slowly finishing up, uh, Nanostring <laughs> invited me to kind of present my work and just kind of show to scientists what you can do with their with their machine and how it compares to what they advertise. Because there can be dis discrepancies between what companies promise you and then what you <laughs> <laughs> what you get once you send your samples. <laughs> <laughs> So do you so, have a bioinformatician to help you with your analysis? I, I have a bioinformatician. Um, we've just hired a second one. And I have to say, <laughs> I also I also learned a lot of bioinformatics um, since the summer. So we um, got data from this kind of nanostring cosmics, um, which is a bias technique. So you only get a thousand genes from, from your 20,000 cells. So it's actually a relatively small data set. And then we did some unbiased transcriptomics where we have half a million cells and 30 g 30,000 genes in total and that was such an unruly data set that the bioinformatician is analyzing that because everyone decided I wasn't qualified um, and I get to play with a slightly smaller manageable data set um, but yeah I, I I learned a lot of bioinformatics it's it's, a, it's interesting yeah it's the fun of doing omics you kind of have to learn <laughs> <laughs> You kind of get thrown, but I also think once you once you sit down and you have your own project, you do pick it up relatively 
quickly in a way. I find there's who wants to be like, oh wow, and you're like, no, you just you have to. This is just pure survival. Just like you learn how to keep cells alive, you learn how to do your own analysis. <laughs> So I presented data from our landmark um, finger interventional trial, which was um, one of the world's first multi-domain lifestyle interventions mm. to show any type of therapeutic benefit in terms of like you know cognition, but also functional outcomes, and more recently cost benefits. And so I'm very interested in biomarkers with different contexts of use, so diagnostic, prognostic, but also like treatment response, right? Especially with all the advent of the disease modifying therapies, um, given that we had a, an intervention that actually worked. I wanted to see if we could um, identify a marker, for instance, that would tell us, you know, whether people in the intervention groups, you know, what are those mar what are the biological mechanisms for how they actually um, perform better than those in the control groups. And so I'm very interested in HPA axis, and the marker that I chose was cortisol. Um, and we and um, my group have shown that cortisol hypersecretion um, um, not only is associated with um, a predicting cognitive decline, but it also predicts progression from a pre from the preclinical state. And because the finger participants were at risk, so cognitively unimpaired relatively at baseline, um, it just seemed like a good marker to trial, right? Mm. Um, so. Went on to do the analysis, did the cortisol samples, and that was what I presented, and hypothesized that yes, so we would see lower levels of cortisol in the intervention group post intervention compared to the control group. Found absolutely no change. <laughs> <laughs> I did think, why are why are you going to present negative data? But we're scientists, right? That's what we yeah. we have to be. You know, we have, we, have to, we have to say everything. Hmm. What I did find though was that, um, and I'd found this actually previously, and so it was nice to see some consistency showing that at least baseline cortisol was associated with was able to predict odds of being amyloid positive versus negative mm. but it was also able to predict brain longitudinal brain changes so with gray matter volume um, particularly and an AD cortical signature so that was quite interesting and I think our next step is because it was a lifestyle intervention we noted that not everyone was adherent um, so not everybody in the intervention group actually like yeah. <laughs> adhered to the protocol. Yeah. So I think that we're gonna check, um, you know, in that adherent group to see whether it, you know, the hypothesis still stands. Mm. So, so what were the interventions? Ah, so it was a so the so fingers it might be are difficult like difficult to attend. <laughs> <laughs> so you have physical activity, you have nutritional guidance, cognitive um, stimulation, or you know. Or, um, um, or, or cognitive activities. We also have like vascular risk monitoring, and it's all embedded within this social engagement framework. So um, it's been tested and trialed now in, um, I think we're now in over 45 countries. Mm. Um, so it's really expanded. The model is being ultra -cult culturally adopted around the world mm. globally. So exciting times. And why do you think the cortisol didn't change? My, you hypothesis, right? <laughs> so my guess is um, because there is already exist, existing evidence from single domain trials that show that, say, for example, with physical activity, with yoga and mindfulness, that cortisol levels do change in response to, in response to these sort of interventions. And I've published on this before. So I was expecting like a huge, huge, huge significant change. I think that because we looked in such a large sample, um, and also because we didn't well, the, we didn't focus on those who actually adhered to an intervention, we might have masked the actual effect. So mm -hmm. there might still be a change, mm -hmm. and we really need to say so we really need to do that. Um, you know, to really look into mm -hmm. whether or not that um, adherence group have have indeed have their cortisol levels have have lowered, because then that provides you know some evidence on a potential biomarker for monitoring like treatment mm -hmm. response. So you said there was like an improvement for, you know, single domain studies and you just focused on yoga and mindfulness or, yeah. you know, whatever that is. Is Exercise, it just yeah. too many things at once for all the people that have their life to live and, oh. you know, friends to see and family and whatever? <laughs> it's like, you know, if you've got these five massive yeah. changes that they've got yeah. to change for their everyday life, is it just too many things at once? So your adherence is low? Do you well, think? I mean, that's a really good question, actually. Um, so what we found was, um, and there's been the adherence study has been published um, so there are various factors that determine adherence because the 
um, the, the interventions are embedded within a social framework, the feedback actually from participants even within the intervention group was they enjoyed it, they enjoyed that social, you know, the social aspect of things. But I know, of course, I do think that um, even, the, you know, these are elderly individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and what surprised me though was there was cognitive benefits. So there was an actual, like the, the primary outcome was met. Um, so it could be that, you know, that's you know, less sensitive and, and you, know, you need a more sensitive um, increase in the intervention or you need a more sensitive aspect to the intervention to be able to measure biomarker changes. So we've also looked at BDNF as well um, in this group and found that um, in the overall intervention cohorts, no change whatsoever. But when we looked in the adherent cohort, BDNF, actually there were changes. Hmm. So it looks like with the biomarkers, it, people do need to actually do the intervention. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how that works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, nice that, that does make yeah. sense, and yeah. There was a poster on that as well yeah. by a colleague. Okay, well, for anyone listening or watching, you know how these shows work. We take turns at talking about our best bits for this conference. There have been quite a few. So let's go to the highlights. So one of my favorite talks was by uh, Lenora Higginbotham. I think her name is pronounced. Uh, I think she's from Atlanta. Um, so I was quite impressed by her talk because she managed to take some really huge data sets and get them into like a, a 10 minute talk. So uh, I actually, um, one of the data sets that she presented, I'd presented in a journal called before and it took me the best part of an hour to get through it. So <laughs> she's definitely more succinct than me. But um, she did a network proteomics in Lewy body dementias and Alzheimer's disease. And what they were doing is they were seeing if the changes in the different network modules were similar or different between um, Lewy body dementias, including Parkinson's disease, dementia and DLB um, against Alzheimer's disease. And what they found was that uh, modules associated with things like presynaptic signaling and differentiation were different between the two. Um, they also looked at the type of cells where these changes were happening. So as well as having these huge data sets, they were looking at, say, were they happening in neurons, were they happening in astroglia? And most of the modules that were changed appeared to be changed in neuronal cells. So the actual sort of the specificity of the things that they were looking at was quite impressive. And I'm really interested in sort of looking further into their Lewy body dementia data to see how things like Parkinson's disease, dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies compare against Parkinson's without dementia. Mm -hmm. Because I would expect the two of those to look quite similar. Mm -hmm. But if you can compare them to Parkinson's without dementia, maybe we can get an idea of what's contributing to the cognitive symptoms as opposed to the motor symptoms in those diseases. Mm -hmm. So I'm just quite excited at these kind of data sets, especially the omics data sets <laughs> um, and seeing like what more they can do with that data. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about highlights? <laughs> yeah, I can. I'm happy to, um, you know, just give a broad overview um, <laughs> of, you know, some of the highlights and things that I like. But I have to start with a major caveat. Um, I came to the conf in, in this sort of conferences, I tend to have loads of meetings. <laughs> and so I had to be very specific about which, um, you know, which symposiums, which talks which places um, I wanted to attend and view. So I focused on biomarkers because that's, um, you know, my area of interest. And I, I was quite, you know, focused in terms of like, you know, areas of research interest, areas I wanted to really understand what this current state um, was, um, is and what the new discoveries were. Um, because, you know, the menu <laughs> available was just, it was amazing. Kudos to ADPD. So there were so many talks and like, you know, the state of fluid and imaging biomarkers with distinct context of use. Um, and, it, it, you know, from way from experimental models to, you know, lots of like new discoveries, for example, around like isotopes of existing markers. I like the Tau3, P Tau396 um, talk, but um, I, th I would say my current favorite was one that was beautifully derived by um, Dr. Thomas Karikari, um, the brain derived Tau. <clears throat> um, I found that really exciting and it was really interesting to see because of course we're always talking about ATN and working in clinical trials it's so important to be able to stratify participants accurately so we've got in blood AT and you know 
with Total Town not being super specific for N, it was great to see that there's potentially a new N on the horizon. <laughs> so, carry on that research. Um, but I was also interested in methodologies. Um, so, for instance, I'm really trying to sp be specific about the types of um, the analytes that we're measuring, but also the fluids or um, 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 that we're, we're looking at. So I looked into like the, um, I went to the exosome symposium and it was great to see they discussed like actual methods for isolation of brain derived exomal vesicles which are notoriously impossible <laughs> um, to, to isolate um, and I was quite pleased because we'd done our group um, at the biofluids based biomarker peer had done like a review to see well what are these what are the antibodies that we could use to really be specific um, and it was great to see like people are now looking at extracellular you know synaptic targets um, as well and this was excellently showcased by um, I think Dimitrios Kapoyanis um, and Gagan Deep as well um, and you guys have discussed like the um, physician approaches that we talked about like the multi-omic studies I found those really nice um, including the proteomics but I, I guess you know because I, you know, I work in discovery science, but I'm very interested. My background is translational neuroscience, and I'm always thinking, how are we going to benefit the patients? So I know I said I was going to start with what I like, <laughs> <laughs> but I really want to also highlight that um, I was encouraged because we're now at the stage of thinking about real world implementation. Um, and there was a Roche symposium where um, Dr. Wenda Broski she commented to say that you know we have all of these pieces. Um, and you can imagine from all the excellent talks that we've gone to, um, but we really need to start thinking about how we're going to implement this in real life settings. Mm -hmm. And Professor Chinison gave a really great overview of strategies for implementing these sort of blood-based biomarkers and the applicable context. So I'm going to stop now because I'm... <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I can, no, keep going, yeah, keep going. I can go on into the things that I think we need to do later. <laughs> the conference should focus on later <laughs> yeah. um yeah i think the conference has been really broad and diverse and yeah, yeah you're absolutely right there's so many different pieces of research that are coming yeah. together which is really nice but um i sort of almost feel a little bit like a minority because i actually work with patients like real mm. patients every day yeah. i know mm. what my patients are doing and what impacts yeah. them and you know there's been um just a handful of things that I've seen so far because there's heaps of blood biomarkers yes. and, you know, genes and stuff. Yeah. And that's been amazing. And it's really good seeing a different side of yeah. the research that's really different to my own. But, yeah, coming back to, you know, how is this going to benefit the patient is really important. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I thought there's been a few really interesting talks around um, one, I think, yesterday, potentially maybe the day before. <laughs> All my days are one now. Um, P uh, Professor Peter Snyder from the University of Rhode Island. Um, he was looking at uh, retinal biomarkers, um, which I think is really Ooh. interesting. Um, um, my work a lot of the time is in perception and, you know, whether our patients are interacting well with their environment, they can identify what they're looking at, you know, those sort of perceptual issues. You know, I've been able to see personally with patients that, you know, those sorts of things tend to go a bit earlier and they get missed, um, you know, memory is something you can't really hide but you know perceptual things like if you accidentally bump into a table or something you know it's you're clumsy it's not oh my god I'm about to get dementia you know like you know if you start forgetting to pick your child up from school or whatever <laughs> that's a problem um so I, yeah I thought it was quite interesting um coming from you know actually what's happening from the eye rather than you know what's happening in terms of the pathways that are leading to your you know your visual cortex and how you're perceiving what's in front of you um so yeah he was um really interesting to talk to and he's totally right um you know we don't have these tests for dementia that people do all the time but you know you see your optometrist every couple of years because your eyes are terrible like and if you're me you see them every year and you get new glasses every year so you know as we get older our vision you know degrades a little bit so you get stronger glasses and you're seeing an optometrist or an ophthalmologist every year or two so having some sort of screening process there um mm. to sort of see if there's anything going on where they can refer you to a neurologist to potentially catch that a bit earlier i think is really exciting um so he was saying you know the retina is one of very few exposed tissues we have access to in a person <laughs> so you know if there's a way that we can sort of have a look at that um and have a better idea of what's happening there it'll be important um so in the retina there's um the inner plexiform layer i think um is got a cholinergic system within its layer um and cholinergic systems and degeneration in those systems seem to be 
pointing towards you know cognitive deficits and a lot of different mm. um, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so because there's some sort of cholinergic input there, there's something happening. So he was saying that um, there's a decrease in the layer of uh, the decrease of the thickness of that layer, sorry, in the eye pill in the eye, and that's happening quite early. Um, and in that layer, you can sort of see these like little inclusion bodies in the peripheral. Um, that we have missed, I guess, um, that a lot of cognitively normal people don't have. Um, so it sounds really um, interesting and exciting, um, especially because that sort of thing was happening before these people had, um, you know, their amyloid beta and tau deposits sort of coming up on their CSF. It was sort of prior to that in this preclinical stage. Mm. So, um, yeah, kind of interesting to see that there's other things out there that's kind of pointing towards oh, yeah. perceptual things happening yes. earlier than what we thought, which is good. That sort of, you know, validates yeah. my research project. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's interesting that it's even happening from the eye before it even gets to the cortex. Mm. So um, I thought mm. that was really interesting. And yeah, he's totally right. If we can identify these changes in asymptomatic, potentially amyloid positive people before these symptoms start happening, we can absolutely help them better manage their disease. They can, you know, talk to their families and their loved ones and sort of get a plan in place for how they're going to handle the next few years which is really important like that's a real world patient outcome which Absolutely. is really important and i think also kind of then moving into the future once we have disease modifying yeah. uh, therapies you really want to get them into the Absolutely. patients as soon yeah. as as you can yeah. diagnose Absolutely. them yeah. so i think that's the that's the other thing where I think at the moment we are catching it so late that there's, um, a, you know, a lot going on and there are a lot of comorbidities. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. in that way, I really enjoyed the plenary session yesterday from Dr. Musa Udem. God, that was butcher. But OK, we all know who I'm talking about, <laughs> about PD therapies. We very much made a point at the beginning to say there is a lot going on what we call parkinson's is made up of psychi psychiatric symptoms as well as motor symptoms and there's there's so much going on are we and I, i've been thinking that for a while now is, is that should we at one point maybe drop what we currently call alzheimer's disease and parkinson's and maybe go more towards the syndrome route of of the things you know of, of, of better stratifying the diseases because mm -hmm. i think that also is this is a big problem we still have in the field where there's there's there is a lot going on and a lot of comorbidities yeah, so it really impacts yeah. and it helps now that you can go and you know do a spinal tap as you know painful and distressing as that sort of seems to be like you know you get your csf done and you do what you don't have alzheimer's and yeah. you know if you don't have it and then it's like okay well what's next what's the next step what's the next thing we're looking for because you know that's the only thing we can definitely confirm that somebody has or not you know Parkinson's dementia is totally different. Mm -hmm. Dementia with Lewy body is totally different. We don't have yeah. a definite indicator whether somebody's got it or not. It's a process of elimination. Yeah, no, that doesn't Which is, takes so long. It takes so long, yeah. But the average turnaround for a diagnosis is what, three and a half years? So <laughs> it's two, three and a half years too long. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot yeah. of change in three and a half years, yeah. you know? Like, yeah. you have to get it earlier than that. Yeah, I think that the research with sleep as well around DLB, um, you know, and all of the new sleep type um, biomarkers mm. and tools. Um, mm -hmm. There are some fantastic talks in like EEG and sleep, so those could they sound promising for detecting yeah. um, DLB early potential. Yeah, I'm looking forward to going to some of those because yes. I think there's some of those coming up today. Yes. Oh yeah, this yeah. in the <laughs> afternoon. Yeah, I know. Hi, let's say yet to come. <laughs> um, sort of going off uh, what both of you were saying. So, firstly, seeing inclusions not just in the brain but also in the yes. retina, and also yeah. talking about um, not just considering these as diseases, but Mara's syndromes is other things going on. Um, sort of a talk I went to yesterday, yesterday by Kevin Javanchuri. Um, so he was talking about alpha synuclein inclusions in the heart of people with Lewy body mm -hmm. um, diseases. And um, he found that 88% of them had inclusions in cardiac nerves. Like absolutely none of the controls had it. It was a disease specific thing. Mm -hmm. And it was happening very early on. So even people with like brainstem type mm -hmm. Lewy body dementia had these inclusions. And not only that, but um, sudden cardiac death accounted for about half of deaths in oh. these people that they looked at. So um, we've seen a similar thing in Huntington's where it's the second most common cause of death is cardiac failure. Wow. So I think we need to sort of start thinking that these aren't just brain diseases. These are full body diseases and we need to start looking at them in a more sort of holistic manner. Yeah. And it would certainly be very useful if we could get tissues that were just brain and <laughs> bioflu is like i'd love to have a look at the huntington's heart but i don't know how to get hold of that tissue um, without like like 
going out and going out to specific patients mm -hmm. and seeing if we can do it that way but there's not really banks that cater to that sort of thing and I think it's a shame that we're not collecting other types of tissue when we're collecting the brain tissue. Mm. Definitely, never crossed my mind, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's go. Yeah, um, that's quite interesting because um, I think one something I took from that, but also um, just generally something that struck me within the conference was um, the use of like personalized medicine approaches mm. because you really need to think about person centered and like you're saying, like you know, really think about things as a syndrome because a lot of this presents with underlying and uh, additional um, 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 conditions as well but it's really nice to see that they're starting to think outside the box and use this personalized medicine approaches with development for example of AD therapeutics so I'm quite interested in drug discovery so um, it was nice to go to some of those industry um, type presentations but also see academ academics as well being involved in the you know um, therapeutics development process and um, what I noted was people are no longer just looking across board, but they're really targeting, like how you've talked about the cardiac, was it the cardiac myocytes? Specifically uh, the cardiac the, nerves. The cardiac nerves. Yeah. So they're targeting specific profiles as well, and it's showing like a lot of promise. So um, I think one example um, was, there was this trial, um, I think um, it was presented by Alzion's um, CEO, and um, what they've done is they've used, they used like a, so they're targeting, um, precisely targeting subpopulations of people um, to, to, with, with specific um, risk profiles. So with Alzion, they had like an APOE4 enriched cohort. Um, and then, you know, and they looked at, and they are actually um, like seeing, I think what they presented, um, it was yesterday. Yeah, or two days ago now. So, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's the one day. So, yeah, but what was exciting was you are seeing effect sizes even better than the Sanimab that we're all excited about. I mean, it's incredible. Um, and then I also saw another one. I think it was in the same um, symposium, actinogens 11 beta HSD1 in inhibitor. I was I went there for the actinogen because it in, <laughs> it modulates cortisol, and, but it was great to like see efficacy by just targeting those with tau abnormality. And I think that this sort of um, you know personalized approaches will be quite useful. But um, I would say that my one of my favorites, I think, um, within the within the, um, the the talks I've attended so far was um, Miranda Orr, um, and she's you know an academic, and she used you know it was translational approaches, but um, she she's looking not just at AD or PD, you know she's looking at like senescence, so sen with her senolytics, so looking at cellular senescence. And it's a particular pathway that can then be evolved to multiple neurodegenerative diseases. And I think that approach is really fascinating. And we need this sort of combinatory therapies. But I mentioned finger, but what I should have said was fingers now being adapted to then add on like um, therapies. So Mia Kivipelto, who founded um, Finger, she gave a really good presentation on this topic, I think. Also, to the, I think they were waiting for the Swedish queen or something to turn up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they're combining the lifestyle um, modify um, lifestyle modification with an anti-diabetic, and it's obvious that these are you know we need to really start thinking outside the box when we're thinking towards like therapies for AD. So mm. it's great to see that. Yeah, thinking about like yes. outside of the box, I really enjoyed a talk actually just from this morning from Hisoka Tanginava. He Ooh. looked at um, kind of. His introduction was like the hallmarks of a cat, like for finding hallmarks of cancer and how that can be applied to uh, yes. neurodegeneration. Yeah. And so they did this huge study with like 400 patients, single cell RNA seq, and you're just think like, what are you going to do with all of this data? Yeah. And they pulled out these transcriptional hallmarks um, to kind of say, okay, what, what, can we stratify patients? Can, can we stratify them with that? And now I found that was such an interesting approach of saying, okay, other diseases, particularly cancer, they are further in terms of treatments. What can we, what can we take yeah, from them? What from can that. we steal yeah, in absolutely. terms of like conceptual uh, aspects? And I really like this idea of like, can we find hallmarks that connect patients? And that ultimately they found some hallmarks that could correlate with this kind of resilience that was discussed quite a lot this morning. 
kind of saying we have patients with similar loads of pathology without going on to develop dementia. And I think that was just a really nice way of tying together like all of these, you know, kind of four, um, four brains here and four brains there that have been staying to kind of look at like what's the difference between resilience and controls. And that's kind of where I come from and to kind of saying like we, we flip it around. We can, yeah. we, instead of going from a resilient patient, can we identify them yeah. afterwards? Yeah. So I thought that was very um, interesting. Yeah as well yeah. and it's really important because patients are so diverse especially as you get older you get more diseases it's not just you know you don't just have alzheimer's yeah. or just have parkinson's <laughs> and that's it everything else is fine and dandy you know like there's so many different things that go into it so yeah if we can definitely steal something from cancer research and you know <laughs> shorten the time it takes to get to the end and fully understand what happens in these elderly people like it'll make a, it'll go a really long way I've been quite excited by the the Amsterdam the over one hundreds cohort that oh, yeah, they've that been was collecting. Amazing. Oh yeah, it's been a couple of talks with them. Yeah, talking They're about really good, yeah. sort of how they differ, their brains differ to mm. those of people with that went on to develop AD, um, and they were talking about how mm. even in healthy people over a hundred who had higher say tau brac stages, for example. Mm. Uh, it didn't correlate with their cognition, but when they looked at the amyloid load, it did. And um, two thirds of them had a lower amyloid beta load than the very lowest AD patient. Wow. So it seems to be that um, when we're sort of defining the disease and when we're stratifying it, we will use these sort of traditional staging systems, which are good, but also taking into account other things like amyloid load, probably quite important if we want to have a look at resilience mm -hmm. and how Definitely. people respond to treatment because it seems that other factors are in play here. Exactly. I was like, yes, yeah. keep talking about this interior <laughs> surgery. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was yeah amazing that, you know, they went through all the stuff, they did their cognitive testing, they did, um, you know, this huge proteinomic sequence of these people i don't know i'm not in um, basic science but yeah you know getting to the point where you know they have younger brains and even though they have you know an amyloid accumulation which potentially falls somewhere on the normal spectrum they still had younger brains you know compared to um the other people that were had diseases or whatever um because they had you know less aggregated tau and you know more protein folding and um less uh, more neurofilaments and that sort of stuff so it was yeah quite interesting to see that it'd be cool to see how to age without cognitive decline yeah. and, and make it to 100 yeah. yeah absolutely but yeah it was um really interesting i really enjoyed those talks yeah yeah just going back to your comment about comorbidities mm. um it would be quite important um i don't think we can like ignore that excellent plenary um by professor mielke where she mm. described disparities around blood biomarkers i it was refreshing to see that because i didn't see a lot of like people controlling for this sort of um, disparities um, in their own studies, as, as, you know, a lot of the talks that I went to anyways. Um, but, you know, she talked about it in relation to comorbidities across different ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. um, and what struck me even, I, I, I was blown by Professor John, I think John Morris's talk, showing how biomarkers relate to social determinants of health, because we always focus on like um, ethno-racial disparities and ignore socioeconomic disparities because that can actually influence blood biomarkers and those are really related to comorbidities um so it's really sad for me i guess um for, uh, to see that you know those sort of important characteristics and still not being fully considered when we're analyzing um data from real world cohorts um and most of the cohorts being described i guess they're still homogeneous in terms of ethnicity education level most of them are high socioeconomic status mm -hmm. so we're seeing data from you know a very subject. small percent yeah. of the population um and given the accelerations in drug and biomarker development and validation efforts i think the field just needs to do better with increasing representation when mm -hmm. thinking about these new cohorts and yeah. I'm hoping that these considerations will be integrated in developing like appropriate use criteria and guidelines for how we're going to use biomarkers for different contexts. There was a talk earlier just before this session um, by Dr. Federico Massa, mm -hmm. and here he used the Delphi model to define, define a biomarker-based workflow to diagnose different neurodegenerative diseases, and he, he was using a multimodal biomarker. But again, the cut points have been developed in very, very mm -hmm. homogeneous populations. And for me, that's a good example of an approach to develop 
you know, these sort of um, diagnostic workflows. But until we have enough diversity within yeah. our samples, we're going to get in trouble because we'll see that, you know, especially with the blood markers where, you know, comorbidities completely change the picture. Socioeconomic status, independent of ethnicity, change the picture. Yes. So, you yeah. know, we Both really, really yeah. need to. I mean, yeah, socioeconomic I states in particular, I mean, we've heard so much about vascular comorbidities yeah. and we know how closely those are linked yeah. with socioeconomic exactly. status. So. Exactly. And I mean, the reason it doesn't get looked at much is because of the type of samples we get and the type of yeah. recruitment we have. Yeah. So hopefully the sort of the pushes towards getting more representative cohorts, yeah. it actually at least gets looked at. Yeah, I think in one of the, um, it was not at all, um, it was a little bit off, traffic, off topic from um, the cholinergic um, imaging symposium from yesterday. Um, they were looking at, um, cholinesterase inhibitors for drugs and that sort of stuff and one of the questions came up and the presenter couldn't answer it but in the last year they changed the recommendations for um, the dosage for cholinesterase inhibitors because women have more side effects because all of the drug trials and stuff have been on men so oh, yeah. they're getting like a big, I know but they did Please. yeah and that's only just happened and it, like people mm. weren't aware of it and it was mm. amazing that you know it shouldn't have been missed, but you know, having that lower dose of that medication might have a much better impact on female patients because we exactly. aren't having diverse samples when it comes to drug yeah. development, and that's yeah. been a big focus of this conference. Is you know the the drug rollout, but yeah. you know, it, okay, like how is that the actually? Diversity, but... No, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> the diversity. Okay. No, but yeah, there's like every second talk has been about this, uh, you know, drug development. But yeah. you know, it yeah. absolutely comes down to well, who are you testing? What are you measuring? And you know, is it actually working? And it should exactly. massively be focused towards personalized medicine because everybody is so different. <laughs> so yeah, seeing what drugs work for what people is going to be really important. It can't just be it'll work for Alzheimer's. Full stop. It needs to go beyond that. I think that's a that's a really good point and. I think this is um, where we'll slowly think of, we've we've talked about oh, our main <laughs> yeah, well, that, well, that's, that's what we'll do next but yes. before that we'll, we'll finish this up here um, and I think that's that's a really good kind of yeah conclusion of this that th there is a lot moving in the field now but we really researchers we're always looking for the next question yeah. and we know the next problem yeah. that that we now need to solve which yeah. is this diversity yeah. but before we wrap up I have one last question uh, given that we've all of the talks we've seen is there one tip that you want to share about what makes a good presentation? I think we all have opinions on this now. <laughs> Should I start? <laughs> I, okay, I'll start. I've, 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 I've to start. I think my, my tip would be assume your audience is ever so slightly less informed and sleepier than you currently think they are. <laughs> Just yeah. break it down. I think like, like I like a good introduction slide about Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's at any, at any talk, because then you know roughly where that presenter is coming from. So I really like the dumbed down, easy to follow <laughs> talks. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, some presentations would benefit on choosing more of a focus. So obviously you can have these huge, really impressive data sets, but you've only got so much time to talk about them. So picking out particular bits and really being clear and explaining how they're relevant to people that don't work in those fields is really important if you actually want to get your message across yeah. clearly. Yeah, yeah and um, my tip really follows along those lines just because you know, I was late a couple of times for things <laughs> because I couldn't get away from time. <laughs> I'm late for really important meetings. So I, I do think that I'm being very conscious of time and perhaps the moderator's not getting too carried away. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the talks I went to, they did fantastic jobs of like trying to um, moderate and explain, you know, you're coming close to the time and, but you know, because when you go over, then people who have burning questions and somewhere to get to are one, not able to ask, you know, during the session, because asking questions at the sessions are really informative. I learned so much from yeah, the question the questions. sessions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, not that I didn't learn from the talks, but it's really great to really see how people are thinking and mm. a lot of the things that they're not able to put within the talks. Um, they're then able to really explain and expand on it and really have a dialogue around around it. And I think it's lessons for both the audience and perhaps even the presenter. So ensuring that you're um, as close to time as possible, one minute over, we won't kill you, but you know, <laughs> 10 minutes over is like, 
um, yeah. hmm. really difficult for everyone. Yeah. Um, I think, oh no, you guys might be different, but there's been a few talks where it's just all this background, all this, all these methods that, you know, potentially aren't really useful. And then you've got one slide at the end that sort of gives you the results. It's like, no, that's the interesting part. Like, yeah. you know, like I'm, I'm not in, a, you know, genomics and blood biomarkers, like tell me the basic of what I need to know and then mm. tell me the important parts of your research yeah. and focus on that. Like show me the cool graphs and the cool mm. pictures and the, mm. you know, the histology, like show me that cool stuff and really talk me through that. But before that, just give me the bare minimum I need to understand your graph. <laughs> like I know there's a lot that goes into a project and, you know, for some out of field like you know just tell me the amazing part of your research that's what i want to see that's what the most of your time should be not the last 10 minutes uh the last two minutes of your 15 minute talk <laughs> you know, to, yeah no, no i have i have so many questions like what what did you do next like how does this work like yeah absolutely like you know tell me the cool part about your research that's what i want to hear i mean on that theme uh, it's something that's come up at previous conferences where Obviously, everyone's doing different things. You have your own specialization, but you also have clinical and you have basic scientists. Yeah. And they so often have very little knowledge of how yeah, each other's sci- type, type of science works. Mm-hmm. So giving all these like really detailed explanations yeah. doesn't help. You need to no. explain it in a way that someone who doesn't do what you do exactly, understands. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. It's a very different thing to writing a paper on yeah. one. <laughs> I have found, like, with these, because I'm obviously not a basic scientist, and I'm like, you know, we've shown that this is correlated with cognitive impairment and this is done whatever. I'm like, cool, so what's your measure of cognitive impairment? Like, oh, we just did a test. I'm like, cool, what test? Like, <laughs> this is this is what I do. Like, I'm actually interested. I want to know what's how you're measuring this stuff. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's called a something, something, something. And I'm like, all right, yeah, they don't, know, they don't know what it is. I'm like, you know, the cognitive stuff is what the patients actually care about. You know, that's yeah. their everyday day-to-day stuff. Yeah. So even if it correlates with whatever your cognitive impairment measure is, like it needs to be a good one. <laughs> you know, it can't just be like a really hard test that everybody's going to fail. You know, it needs to be something that's specifically and targeted to their cognitive ability. There's a converse as well, where if you're a basic scientist, you obviously know some of the cognitive tests, but sometimes you just get an acronym. It's like, well, yeah, exactly. what kind of cognition it, is this measuring? It definitely, it definitely is heading that way. Because you're like, yeah, we just run the whatever. And it's like, cool, well, what is that? I don't, you know, we don't use that in Australia. Tell me what it is. And like, oh, well, it, just, it gives you a global sense of their cognition. I'm like, yeah, I get that. But like, <laughs> what are they actually doing? It's, um, yeah, it's absolutely, you're totally right. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's that next step. Just, yeah, that's exactly. Just, just, cool, yeah, just like pull like it all people. together. Yeah. Exactly. That you, you never normally, exactly. like, last time I read a biomarker <laughs> paper might have been a while ago. But now you've got someone spoon feeding to you and you're like, yes, 50 minutes of yes. my... Yes, yes. I'm, an, I'm an expert now, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like, I feel like I, I know what's happening in the field now without having read... Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. Can yeah. I just share um, one observation, though? Um, just because um, there's been, like, multiple papers now I'm talking about like gender balanced panels mm. um, and how they actually affect um, you know questions um, during sessions and engagement from audience um, so for the ones that I most of the panels that I attended I did note the gender balance and I did note ECRs asking questions and women asking questions, which is different to the Lancet paper where they actually looked at it and then provided recommendations for gender balance. So it sounds like ADPD might have read the paper and then <laughs> did something about it and it's actually worked. Though I don't know if they'll be able to um, check those metrics, but it was mm-hmm. quite interesting to see something I'd read in a paper as a gap and then actually see yeah. it work in real time was yeah, cool. really fascinating. And I love the question and answers during presentation. Mm. I'm still in that tip because <laughs> you've asked for what we what one advice is have like a to to really engage because presentations and you're right, like some of them are super early. I'm not a morning person anymore. Right? You're trying so hard. Maybe you haven't had a coffee or you just managed to get like you're trying to finish your coffee. But when you engage people with, you know, those um I think they had like these um the interactive sessions where you yeah. got to vote. I always woke up at those times. So <laughs> that that, that really helped. Yeah, that's exactly, <laughs> I wake yeah. up for the fun games. Yeah, it's going to be entertaining. It's going to bring you yeah, all yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, I was yeah. upset at one of the forums that I went to where I think they forgot to actually look at the audience questions. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Like, like, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm for I'm my answer. I'm here for that. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. <laughs> it's like, your discussion is interesting, but there's questions. Yeah, yeah that's on. it. Yeah, I'm ready. Like, <laughs> tell me if I'm right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's um, yeah, it's been quite good. 
so that's all we have time for I hope you enjoyed listening or watching and if you want to find out more about any of the research we discussed head over to the ADPD website the online portal is open for another 30 days I didn't know this and then we have to register wow cool um, thank you to my fabulous guests um, this has been so much fun we had Dr. G Udo Mama and I'm learning uh, fabulous <laughs> Dr. Melissa Schofield and the incredible Emily McCann. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> and I'm Dr. Anna Malak, and you've been listening to the Dementia Researcher podcast. Brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world.